previously in episode six. Harold Shea, between bouts of cockroach racing and 20th century psychology, had persuaded the troll guard Snog that he could perform magic to shrink Snog's nose, making it possible for Snog to win his true love, Elva Gavu. Snog had agreed to gather together materials for him to create his magic. With incantations and a cloud of vapor, Harold called on the names of the ancestors of wizardry to power his spells. After the hocus pocus, Harold was astounded to see that he had indeed accomplished this feat of magic. Snog's nose was no bigger than any other normal nose. The laws of this world were true for him too. Having thus won Snog's gratitude and loyalty, they prepared for their escape. Snog brought them clothing and weapons. While they were dressing, he outlined his plan for getting them out of the tunnels, past the trolls and giants, by use of deception and a chain, claiming that he was taking them to Lord Surt as commanded. Snog and his pretend prisoners wended their way up through the tunnels, past repulsive giants, enduring rival remarks and an occasional hoktui, finally making it out into the night. Just when they thought they had made good their escape, giants caught up with them and they found themselves in a fierce battle. Will Heimdall and Shea win the fight? Will they make it to Jotunheim in time? We continue now with episode seven. Ho ho! Heimdall was standing over his fallen opponent, terrible bloody slashes in the giant's body showing dim red in the light of the burning swords on the ground. Through the guts! Never have I seen a man who used a sword as he would a spear, thrust and not strike by Thor's hammer, warlock Harold. I had not expected to find you, so good a man of your hands. I have seen those do worse who were called berserks and champions. <laughs> he tossed his own sword up to catch it by the hilt. Surely you shall be of my band at the time, though in the end it is nothing remarkable seeing what blade you have there. The big sword had become heavy again and weighted with Shay's arm down. There was a trickle of blood up over the hilt onto his hand. Looks like a plain sword to me. By no means. That is the enchanted sword. Frey's invincible hundings, Bana, that shall one day be Surt's death. Hi, gods and men will shout for this day, for the last of the war weapons of the Aesir is recovered. But we must hurry. Snog! Here. Snog emerged from a clump of tree ferns. Forgot to say, I put troll spell on swords so light from blade don't show giants where we go. It will wear off in a day or two. Can you tell us where there is a mountain tall and cold near here? There's one. Oh, many miles north called Steinbjörg. Walk three days. That is something less than good news. Already we have reached the seventh night since Thor's play with the giants of Jotunheim. By the length of his journey, the wanderer should tomorrow be at the gates of hell. We must seek him there. Much depends on it. Shea had been thinking furiously. If he knew enough to be a warlock, why not use the knowledge? Can I get a hold of a few brooms? Brooms? Strange are your desires, warlock of another world. What you want for? I may be able to work a magic trick. Snug thought for a moment. In Thrall's house, two miles east, maybe brooms. Thrall, he gets sick. Die. Lead on. They were off again through the darkness. Now and then they glimpsed a pinpoint of light in the distance as some one of the other giant search parties moved about, but none approached them. 
The thralls hut proved a crazy pile of basalt rocks chinked with moss. The door sagged ajar. Inside, it was too black to see anything. Snog, can you take a little of the spell off this sword so we can have some light? He held it out. Snog ran his hands up and down the blade, muttering. A faint golden gleam came from it, revealing a pair of brooms in one corner of the single room hut. One was fairly new, the other an ancient wreck with most of the willow twigs that had composed it, broken or missing. Now, I need the feathers of a bird, preferably a swift, as that's about the fastest flyer. There ought to be some around. On roof, I think. You wait, I get. He slid out and they heard him grunting and scrambling up the hut. Presently, he was back with a puff of feathers in his scaly hand. I had been working out the proper spell in my head, applying both the law of contagion and the law of similarity. Now I laid the brooms on the floor and brushed them gently with the feathers. Bird of the South, swift bird of the South, lend us your wings for a night. Stir these brooms to movement, O bird of the South, as swift as your own and as light. I tossed one of the feathers into the air and blew at it so that it bobbed about without falling. Bird Fulnir, greatest of hawks, I invoke you. Catching the feather, he stooped, picking at the strings that held the broom till they were loosened, inserted the feathers in the broom and made all tight again. Kneeling, he made what he hoped were mystic passes over the broom, declaiming, Up, up, arise! Bear us away. We must be in the mountains before the new day. Now, I think we can get to your Steinbjörg soon enough. Snod pointed to the brooms, which in the pale light seemed to be stirring with a motion of their own. You fly through air? With the greatest of ease. If you want to come, I guess that new broom will carry two of us. Snog backed away. Oh, no. No thanks, my yimmer. I stay on ground. You bet. I, I go to Elvagevu on foot. Not break beautiful me. Not you worry. I, I know way. Snog made a vague gesture of farewell and slipped out the door. Heimdall and Shea followed him the latter with the brooms. The sky was beginning to show its first touch of dawn. Now, let's see how these broomsticks of ours work. What is the art of their use? I hadn't the least idea. Just watch me and imitate me. I squatted over the broom with the stick between my legs and hunting's bana stuck through my belt. By oak, ash, and broom, before the night's gloom, we soar to Steinbjörgen to stay the world's doom. The broom leaped up under him with a jerk that almost left its rider behind. She gripped the stick till his knuckles were white. Up, up, up I went, till everything was blotted out in the damp opaqueness of cloud. The broom rushed on at a steeper and steeper angle till I found to my horror that it was rearing over backward. I wound my legs around the stick and clung while the broom hung for a second suspended at the top of its loop with me dangling beneath. It dived. Then I fell over sideways, spun this way and that with me flopping like a bell clapper. The dark earth popped out from beneath the clouds and rushed up at me. Just as I was sure I was about to crash, I managed to swing myself around the stick. 
The broom darted straight ahead at frightening speed, then started to nose up again. I inched forward to shift my weight. The broom slowed up, teetered to a 45 degree angle and fell over into a spin. The black rock of Muspelheim whirled madly beneath. I leaned back, tugging up on the stick. The broom came out of it and promptly fell into another spin on the opposite side. I pulled it out of that, too, being careful not to give so much pressure this time. By now I was so dizzy I couldn't tell whether I was spinning or not. For a few seconds the broom scudded along with a pitching motion like a porpoise with the edge. This was worse than Thor's chariot. Shay's stomach, always sensitive to such movements, failed him abruptly and he strewed Muspelheim with the remains of his last meal. Having accomplished this, he set himself grimly to the task of mastering his steed. He discovered that it had the characteristics of an airplane, both longitudinally and laterally unstable. The moment it began to nose up, down, or sideways, the movement had to be corrected instantly and to just the right degree, but it could be managed. Harold! A thin, drawn-out cry came to me. I had been so busy that I had had no time to look for Heimdall. A quarter mile to my right, the sleepless one clung desperately to his broom, which was doing an endless series of loops like an amusement park proprietor's dream of heaven. I inched my own broom around a wide circuit. A hundred yards from Heimdall, his mount suddenly stopped looping and veered straight at me. Heimdall seemed helpless to avoid the collision, but I managed to pull up at the last minute, and Heimdall, yellow hair streaming, shot past underneath. I brought my own broom around to discover that Heimdall was in a flat spin. As his face came toward me, I noted it looked paler than I had ever seen it. How to control this thing? Oh, very fiend among warlocks. Lean to your left. When she dives, lean back far enough to level her out. Heimdall obeyed but overdid the lean back and went into another series of loops. Shea yelled to shift his weight forward when the broom reached the bottom of the loop. Heimdall overdid it again and took a wild downward plunge, but was grasping the principles of the thing and pulled out again. He pointed down. Never shall we reach Odin in time. Look how already the hosts of Surt move toward Ragnarok. Shea glanced down at the tumbled plain. Sure enough, down there, long files of giants were crawling over it, the flaming swords standing out like fiery particles against the black earth. Which way is the mountain? Heimdall pointed toward the left. There is a high berg in that direction, I think, though still too strong is the fire magic for me to see clearly. Let's get above the clouds then. Ready? Shea shifted back a little and they soared. Gray darkness gripped them, and he hoped he was keeping the correct angle. Then the gray paled to pearl, and they were out above an infinite sea of cloud, touched by ye yellow by a rising sun. Heimdall pointed. Unquestionably, the Steinbjörg lies yonder. Let us speed. Shea looked. He could make out nothing but one more roll of cloud perhaps a little more solid than the others. They streaked toward it. There must be an arresting. How do you stop this thing? They had tried th three times to land on the peak. Each time the brooms had skimmed over the rocks at breathless speed. I'll have to use a spell. Shea swung back, chanting. By oak, ash, and use, and heavenly dew. We've come to Steinbjörgen, land softly and true. The broomstick slowed down and Shea fishtailed into an easy landing. Heimdall followed but plowed deep into a snowdrift. 
He struggled out with hair and eyebrows, all white, but with a literally flashing smile on his face. Warlocks have there been, Harold, but never like you. I find your methods somewhat drastic. If you don't want that broom anymore, I'll take it and leave this old one. I couldn't use it. Take it if it pleases your fancy. But now you too shall see a thing. He put both hands to his mouth. Yo-ho, gold top. Yo-ho, gold top. Your master, Heimdall Odinson, calls. For a while, nothing happened. Then Shay became aware of a shimmering, polychromatic radiance of the air about him. A rainbow was forming, and he in the center of it. But unlike most rainbows, this one was and on. It extended slowly down to the very snow at his feet. The colors thickened and grew solid till they blotted out the snow and clouds and crags behind them. Down the rainbow came trotting a gigantic white horse with a mane of bright metallic yellow. The animal stepped off the rainbow and nuzzled Heimdall's chest. Come. I grant you permission to ride with me, though you will have to sit behind. Mind you, do not prick him with Hundingsbana. Shea climbed aboard with his baggage of sword and broom. The horse whirled around and bounded onto the rainbow. It galloped fast with a long reaching stride, but almost no sound, as though it were running across an endless feather bed. The wind whistled past Shay's ears with a speed he could only guess. After an hour or two, Heimdall turned his head. Svera's house lies below the clouds. I can see it. The rainbow inclined downward, disappearing through the gray. For a moment, they were wrapped in mist again, then out, and the rainbow, less vivid but still substantial enough to bear them, curved direct to the bounder's gate. Gold tops stamped to a halt in the yard, slushy with melting snow. Heimdall leaped off and toward the door where a couple of stalwart blondes stood on guard. Hey, can't I get something to eat? Time is wanting. The sleepless one shouted over his shoulder, disappearing through the door to return in a moment with horn and sword. He spoke a word or two to the men at the door who ran around the house and presently were visible leading out horses of their own. Heimdall buckled on his baldric. Heroes from Valhall set to guard the Gjallarhorn while the negotiations for my release were going on. He snatched up the horn and vaulted to the saddle. The rainbow had changed direction, but lay straight away before them as Goldtop sprang into his stride again. Couldn't you just blow your horn now without waiting to see Odin? Not so, Warlock Harold. The Wanderer is Lord of gods and men. None act without his permission. But I fear me it will come late. Late. He turned his head. Hark, do you hear? Nay, you cannot. But my ears catch a sound which tells me the dog Garm is loose, that great monster. Why does it take Odin so long to get to hell? He goes in disguise, as you saw him on the moor, riding a common pony. The spay wife Grua is of the giant brood, but sure she would refuse to advise him or give him ill advice did she recognize him as one of the Aesir. Goldtop was up out of the clouds, riding the rainbow with what seemed to stretch endlessly before. Shea could only think how many steaks one could get from a huge animal. He had never eaten horse flesh, but in his present mood, he was willing to try. The sun was already low when they pierced the cloud banks again. This time they dropped straight into swirls of snow. Beneath and then around them, Shea could make out a ragged, gloomy landscape of sharp black pinnacles, too steep to gather drifts. The rainbow ended abruptly and they were on a rough road that wound among the rock towers. Gold tops, hoofs 
clop plopped sharply on frozen mud. The road wound around tortuously, always downward into a great gorge, which reared up pillars and buttresses on either side. Snowflakes sank vertically through the still air around them, feathering the forlorn little patches of moss that constituted the only vegetation. Cold tore at them like a knife. Enormous icicles, like the trunks of elephants, were suspended all around. There was no sound but the tread of the horse and his quick breathing, which condensed in little vapor plumes around his nostrils. Darker and darker it grew, colder and colder. Shea whispered, he did not know why, except that it seemed appropriate. Is this hell of yours a cold place? The coldest in the nine worlds. Now you shall pass me up the great sword that I might light our way with it. Shea did so. Ahead, all he could see over Heimdall's shoulder now was blackness, as though the walls of the gorge had shut them in above. Shea put out one hand as they scraped one wall of the chasm, then jerked it back. The cold of the rock bit through his mitten into his fingers like fire. Goldtop's ears pricked forward in the light from the sword. He rounded a corner and came suddenly on a spark of life in that gloomy place, lit by an eerie blue-green phosphorescence. She could make out in that half-light the tall, slouch-hatted figure of the wanderer and his pony beside him. There was a third figure, cloaked and hooded in black, its face invisible. Odin looked toward them as they approached. Hi. Muggin brought me tidings of your captivity and your escape. The second was the better news. Heimdall and Shea dismounted. The wanderer looked sharply at Shea. Are you not that lost one I met near the crossroads? It is none other, and a warlock of power is he, as well as the briskest man with sword that ever I saw. He is to be of my band. We have Hundingsbana and Head. Have you won that for which you came? Enough or near enough. Myself and Vidar are to stand before the sons of the wolf, those dreadful monsters. Thor shall fight the worm. Frey, search. Ullur and his men are to match the hill giants, and you the frost giants as already I knew. Oh, Father, you are needed. The dog Garm is loose, and Surt is bearing the flaming sword from the south, with the frost giants at his back. The time is here. Hey! I know ye now, Odin. Woe the day that my tongue... Heavens, Hag! The deep voice seemed to fill that desperate place with thunder. Blow, son of mine! Rouse our bands, for it is time. Hey, be gone, cursed ones, to whatever place from whence ye came. A hand shot out, and Shay noticed with a prickling of the scalp that it was fleshless. The hand seized a sprinkle of snow and threw it at Odin. <laughs> be gone! The spaywife threw another handful of snow, this time at Heimdall. His only reply was to set the great horn to his lips and take a deep breath. She had a blood-curdling glimpse of a skull under the hood as she scooped up a third handful of snow. Be gone, I say, to whatever misbegotten place ye came from. <laughs> The first notes of the roaring trumpet sang and swelled and filled all space in a tremendous peal of martial, triumphant music. The rocks shook and the icicles cracked, and Harold Shea saw the third handful of snow, a harmless little clot, flying at him from Gru's bony fingers. Well... The detective scratched his head. 
I'm sorry, you can't help me out no more than that, Dr. Chalmers. We got to notify his folks in St. Louis. We get these missing person cases now and then, but we usually find them. You'll get his things together, will you? Certainly, certainly. I thought I'd go over the papers now. Okay. Thanks, Miss Mugler. I'll send you a report with my bill. But I don't want a report. I want Mr. Shea. The detective grinned. You paid for a report, whether you want it or not. You can throw it away. So long. Bye, Dr. Chalmers. Bye, Mr. Bayett. Be seeing you. The door of the room closed. Walter Bayard, lounging in Harold Shea's one good armchair, asked, Why didn't you tell him what you think really happened? Uh, because it would be, uh, shall I say, somewhat difficult to prove. I do not propose to make myself a subject of public ridicule. That wasn't honest of you, Doctor. Even if you won't tell me, you might at least... Bayard wiggled an eyebrow at the worried girl. <laughs> Who was indignantly denying that Harold might have run away from her maternal envelopment when the detective asked her just now? In the first place, it wasn't so. And in the second, it was none of his damn business. And in the third, I think you two might at least cooperate instead of obstructing, especially since I'm paying for Mr. Johnson's services. My dear Gertrude, if I thought it had the slightest chance of doing any good, I should certainly acquaint your Mr. Johnson with my hypothesis. But I assure you that he would decline to credit it. And even if he did, the theory would present no... Uh, a point of application for his investigatory methods. Something in that, Gert. You can prove the thing in one direction, but not the reverse. If Shay can't get back from where we think he's gone, it's a cinch that Johnson couldn't. So why send Johnson after him? <sighs> It'll be a little queer without Harold for all his. The outward rush of displaced air bowled Chalmers over, whipped a picture from the wall with a crash of glass, and sent the pile of Shay's papers flying. There may have been minor damage as well. If there was, neither Gertrude nor Chalmers nor Bayard noticed it. In the middle of the room stood the subject of their talk, swathed in countless yards of blanket-like woolen garments. His face was tanned and slightly chapped. In his left hand, he held a clumsy broom of willow twigs. Hiya! Shay grinned at their expressions. You three had dinner yet? Yeah? Well, you can come along and watch me eat. He tossed the broom in a corner. Souvenir to go with my story. Useful while it lasted, but I'm afraid it won't work here. B but you aren't going out to a restaurant in those garments. Hell yes. I'm hungry. What will people think? What do I care? God bless my soul. Chalmers followed Shay out. The end of the roaring trumpet. <laughs>